While Microsoft Excel has a huge number of users, and GraphPad Prism has a huge footprint in the biomedical research field, a lot of people who emphasize biostatistics in their research have been turning to the R statistical environment in order to do a lot of their, uh, their most recent work. Now, today I'll be demonstrating the use of RStudio, which is a, a repackaging of R to make it a little easier to handle large-scale projects, uh, to do the, the example of the histogram and the, bar plot, uh, the box plots uh, that we were looking at just a moment ago. So at the moment, what we're looking at is the user interface of RStudio, and you can see that I have the ability to look at files that are currently sitting in my documents directory, and over at the left, I have an interactive console that's ready for me to tell it about what I want to do. But the files that I want to work with are not located in my documents. Instead, I have listed them over in uh, uh, a separate directory. So I'm going to start by creating a directory in documents for me to hold this work on histograms and box plots. So I click on new folder, and now I'm going to say this is a histogram box plot demo. OK, I hit OK on that. And now I see that I have a new directory down here for me to work with. I click on that, and I see I've got no files located in there at the moment. So I'm going to do a little background work in uh, Windows Explorer now to grab the two files that I've included in my, my, my practical directory. I'm going to navigate over to Documents. And from Documents, I'm going to go into my new directory, Histogram and Box Plot, and paste that in. And you should see in the background, at the same time as I pasted, those two files appeared within my files menu. So that's brilliant. Now, um, there are things like text editors built into RStudio, which makes it a little easier to visualize this. So if I want to look at my A versus B file, I can click it. And I see that I have a text file with a first row of intensities and labels. And then I have numbers and letters following on every su successive line. So I'm going to close that for now. And now we will start to work our way through the R interface uh, for dealing with these data. So I'm going to start by creating a variable called distn, sort of an abbreviation for distribution. And I'm going to define it as receiving the contents of the distribution file. So I will type the first few letters. And I see even just typing REA, I'm suddenly getting a list of all the different functions I can use that start with REA. I happen to know I want read table. So I can just type that out, or I can actually click on the option. And I want to specify uh, that I want to work from this directory. Now, have I set this as my working directory? I don't recall doing that. That's OK. We'll, we'll see what happens. So I will read a table, and I'm going to read 2018. 0219 distribution.txt. Ah, there's no such file or directory, which tells me that I haven't yet set this as the directory where I want to work. So I can click on the More menu, say Set as Working Directory. I can even check uh, in my current directory here using the List Files command to see if uh, I'm in the correct place. I am. This is good news. Now, Helpfully, R remembers everything that I've done before. So I can use the up arrow to scroll back through the most recent commands and return to that line, creating distribution uh, that's created by reading the contents of that table. OK, now I hit Enter, and apparently nothing happened. Uh, in fact, R typically will give you very little output if your command succeeds. The time when you'll see a lot of red text, of course, is when you have an error or a warning. If I look at the environment uh, uh, area up here, you can see that when I read that, a new variable was created called distn, and there are 400 observations of one variable. That's very helpful. But I would actually like to see um, a little bit about what I got from that. So the most straightforward way to view a variable here is to simply type its name and hit Enter. And you can see that, sure enough, 400 variables pop back. That's not a very easy assessment to read, though, so maybe we should try the summary command. Summary is my very favorite command, uh, because in, a, in an iBlink, you get a whole bunch of information about the distribution of the variable called distribution. So that's, that's wonderful. However, what we're interested in doing here is to create a histogram of this. So I'm going to note that distribution, since we use the read table function, 
has actually got a structure to it. Inside it, there's a column called V1. So anytime I'm talking about the numbers that we read from the file, I have to specify not only distribution, but also the, the field within that, V1, the vector of those numbers. So I, uh, I'm going to first just create a histogram by typing hist dist n dollar sign v1. So I'm trying to create a frequency, uh, a frequency set from this particular vector within distribution, and I'm going to visualize it in a histogram. Ta-da! So we had essentially two steps there. One was the read table command that grabs the data from that file and shoves it into a variable. And the second command is histogram for creating that visualization. That all seems relatively straightforward, I think, but there are some things that we might want to change about this. For one, we might prefer a histogram that has more resolution than that, that separates to a larger number of bars. So I can provide a suggestion to the software about how, uh, how many bars I think there should be. So if I specify that I think that there should actually be 20, I can use the histogram command and give it a second variable and say I'm going to give it 20 as that variable. And here we see that the histogram that is produced suddenly has more bars. Does it have exactly 20? Actually, it doesn't. Uh, instead, the software is using 20 as a suggestion and trying to find reasonable divisions that uh, still fall on sensible boundaries to cut that up. How did I know that that was an available option? Well, in, as I was typing in the hist command, I see that I had a little bit of pop-up help for that. But I'm actually going to show you the, the more direct way to get help on something. If I don't know exactly how a function works, I can say question mark hist. And now, over at the right, I see that I have a lot of information about how to create histograms in this software. So that's, that's brilliant. Now, I'm going to show you one other thing. This being R, there's a lot of detail underneath the surface that's available to us. So let's create a new variable called h. And instead, I'm going to create a histogram all over again, just as I did before. So there's only one difference between this line up here and this one down here. Here, we're simply running hist with not, nothing to capture it, and so it creates a plot. Here, we're capturing the histogram in a variable called h. Again, no response means everything went fine. But I want to know what information came back from this. And just as I did before, I can type variable h by itself and get back all the information that comes from that. So we can see that when I do an ordinary histogram, I have, the software decides that these breaks are the ones it should use and that these are the counts that relate to this. So the frequency table that was uh, built behind the scenes has all of this information um, uh, for us to, to retrieve out. It also gives us not just the breaks of where the, each bar's start and stop point is, but also what are the midpoints of those bars. So that can be quite useful as well. All right, so that's the, that's the breakdown on how we do a histogram using R. Load, the table, uh, load a table from a file into a variable, and then do a histogram using the hist function on that variable. For the second part of the video, again, we want to read a different file to do an A versus B box plot. Uh, for this, we're going to return to our list of files that we produced, and we see that uh, the other file is also in this directory. We copied it at the same time as the other. So we have a different file that we want to read this time. You might think that this option is pretty straightforward. We need to create a variable name, maybe AVB for this one, and we want to use read table again to read the second file, which has the name, don't forget the double quotes, 2018-0219-A versus B text. Okay, so we got no errors in response to that, so we might think everything is just fine. However, if I type summary on AVB, I'm going to spot an error. So we see that AVB has been read into two variables, v1 and v2, variable 1, variable 2, easy. And we see that we have a, a large number of different values for v1, as expected. In fact, there are 80 uh, distinct values there. When it read vector 2, though, it had 81 distinct 
values. We had 40 A's and 40 B's, and we also had the, very, the value labels show up. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? We had a header, if you recall, in this file that gave the variable names, intensities, and labels, but we didn't tell R that we had those labels there. So we need to redo our import. So now I'm going to redo my read table command. I just hit up arrow twice to back up to it. And this time I'm going to specify that this file contains a header, a top line that defines what those values are. I hit enter and it all works this time. So now when I look at my summary, I see that I have an intensities vector Instead of v1, it now uses the label directly from the file, and it has 80 labels that uh, represent these 40 values. So this is all okay. We now have our, our variables in memory. So uh, one of the things that I might want to do at this point is to uh, do a quick visualization of these. Now box plot, uh, again, is just a simple command uh, to, to use. So box plot, just like that. Uh, and now, I'm going to specify a formula. R has the understanding that you can have multiple variables contributing to um, the, the value of a dependent variable. So you might think that y is a function of x. So you might think of this as y equals some weight times x plus an error figure for a simple model. Uh, in this case, we can specify that by saying avb intensities are a function of, that's what the tilde here represents, are a function of the labels. So we are informing the software that these data can be split on the basis of their labels into A and B classes, and we want to visualize intensities as a function of those labels. So when I hit enter, right away I get my, my value back. So before when we produced box plots we saw that we used uh, an upper, upper arrow pointing to the highest value and a lower whisker pointing to the, the lowest value. But we see that R has done something different. It still uses up and upper and lower whiskers to show the main bulk of the data. But on occasion you have data points that fall well outside the others. Maybe they're outliers. So R uses a bit of logic to decide that these values are so high and low that they're not part of the main distribution. And as a result, it has visualized those as a circle outside the, those whisker boundaries. So there are lots of different features that one can use for box plot. If I run the question mark uh, command on this, I see that I can get a whole lot of information back. One of the common things that people use to uh, interrogate their data is to include notches in their plots. So I can say notch equals true, if I remember correctly. Uh, good. And now we see that we have a notched box plot. So a, a quick and dirty appraisal of what these notches mean is that if the notch, if the uh, upper bound for the, for, uh, the lower data is below the lower bound of the, of the uppermost data, then there's some, by, by some criteria, these would be called statistically significant. We're not going to get into all of that right now. But you can see that this kind of information is available to us. You can also do things like uh, produce subsets of these data. For example, I might create a temporary variable that subsets AVB uh, such that labels equal uh, a. Aha! I have, I have botched something. I have uh, forgotten that the subset command does not have an s at the end. Ah! So now when I run this, I get back a new variable called temp, and now I've pulled out just the half of the data that was labeled a rather than the, the label b. So from that, I can still do things like produce histograms, as we talked about just a moment ago, Aha, it doesn't like my variable. That's because temp has structure. Temp has both an intensities field and a labels field. So I'm going to say I want a histogram of the intensities from temp. It appears at the side. I can even do some fancy schmancy plots like a density. So I can say a density plot. Density is not destiny. Density 
of temporary variable intensities. I'll just click on that to, to autocomplete it. And now when I hit enter, I get a smooth plot of, of um, how those data are distributed. So as you can see, there's an awful lot of ways that you can manipulate your data here, and you can get a visual record of what you've done along the way. I could have been writing all of these commands into a script that I saved. Then if I received new data and I wanted to produ produce exactly the same visualization from it, I could simply rerun that script on the, the new file name. So there's an awful lot of power available to us in R, and RStudio helps us to keep all of it organized together just a little better.